great talk and very enlightening from my standpoint um, as a cardiac surgeon. Uh, the variables continue to evolve and as does our practice pattern and we have changed our cardioplegia significantly in the last few years and we've seen much better outcomes with it. And I don't necessarily think it's the magic of the cardioplegia itself, but it's the fact that the delivery of it simplified the operation and made it more, more predictable. And so these are the important things that when you're dealing, in the, dealing with patients, um, especially in the heart room, there's an incredible number of variables, and it very much is chaos theory. Patients are evolving too, and they're coming into the OR in different medications than they were five or 10 years ago, which affects what happens in the operating room. And there's just so many things happening at once that what we've found that is successful practice is the more you can safely simplify practice, the better off you're gonna be. And I think what he just showed echoes what we've seen. Uh, so today I'm gonna be pretty simple and talk about a single valve that we've begun implanting recently. And uh, we're just up the road here. We do a lot of minimally invasive valve surgery, a lot of valve surgery in general. And uh, what we have found, again, is as we simplify the operation, things get more predictable and better uh, from a technical standpoint. So today we're going to talk about uh, sort of this new class of valves which are coming out now, which are sutureless or essentially sutureless valves. Uh, and they have, uh, I think, a role in valve disease, surgically treated valve disease in the future. Not necessarily every patient, but certainly selected patients. Uh, as a point of disclosure, I do consulting and educational work with uh, Edwards, and we have uh, surgeons who come down in their teams to learn about minimally invasive valve surgery at our hospital up the street. So, am I pointing this? I'll just go forward. This one? Yeah. Do I need to point it at anything? No? Okay. There we go. Okay. So this is just uh, the uh, kind of history of the Edwards valves starting off in the 60s and coming up uh, through the Paramount and Magna Ease valve, which we use as well. Uh, we do a lot of transcatheter uh, Taber valve surgery as well, and now more recently into the Edwards uh, Intuity Elite valve. And basically, for what we do uh, is predominantly either in the aortic position, magna or intuity valve at this point uh, for aortic valve replacements that are not TAVR valves. Uh, we also do some uh, St. Jude implantations. Let's just see here. There we go. So the point of this valve is that basically it's a magna valve on top and a sapien valve on the bottom. So that what, we, what our hopes are and what we think we're seeing is the durability of the magna valve with an ease of implantation. Um, and so that, that basically explains the stents on the bottom and the way the valve looks on top. This is very different than some other valves. Uh, it is not compressed down in a specialized delivery system. So, we already do a lot of minimally invasive surgery. We've been doing it since I started here 10 years ago. Uh, what they're seeing is that this is supposed to facilitate minimally invasive valve surgery because the idea is that this is going to make it easier for surgeons to do minimally invasive valve surgery. Uh, what we have seen with training on minimally invasive cases is that it's pretty challenging and there's definitely a generational gap uh, and it is a different vantage point to the heart and there's the majority of surgeons have a very difficult time uh, getting their head around doing, especially right chest, minimally invasive, uh, especially if you're talking central cannulation and things like that. And so if they're going to pull off minimally invasive, for which there is a greater and greater demand and proven benefit of, you don't need to try to, the industry's going to try to simplify this for them. So if you're talking about three interrupted sutures versus 15 pairs of sutures to get a valve in, it's going to make things easier for them. So they think that they'll see increased uh, adoption of minimally invasive cases. Uh, so the way this valve is constructed is with essentially a pericardial valve on top with a thermofix thermo process. Uh, there is uh, a wire uh, alloy um, skeleton to it, just like in the, uh, the magnet valve, uh, which is a little bit, I would say it's a little bit flexible, not completely flexible. Uh, and then on the bottom is really what makes this different is this skirt on the bottom, which is a stainless steel frame uh, covered with cloth. And that is the part that flares out when you balloon inflate it. And I'll show you a video of this in a minute, which seats the valve. 
there are three quote unquote guiding sutures to help secure it down to the annulus, but essentially the hemostasis and prevention of power valvular leak is because of that skirt beneath the valve. So they're looked at, at durability, and like the, magne, like the magnet valve, we expect this valve, because it is not crimped into a delivery system that is small, it's not crimped at all, uh, it is essentially a magnet valve on top that it should have the durability of the other third generation tissue valves, which, as you probably know, are very good. We expect in patients uh, who are over 60 or 65 that these tissue valves are going to be in 20 years later. And, you know, I've been doing surgery down here for 10 years. I've not explanted these valves yet. So we'll see in another 10 years if I'm pulling out a lot of these valves. But the studies speak for themselves that these are very durable valves, and we expect this with this valve as well. So this is the delivery system. Uh, it is not crimped. This delivery system on top here uh, is inserted into the valve, and there's a balloon at the bottom down here, which then seats it just below the aortic annulus. So what we do is we debris the aortic annulus like you would on any aortic valve replacement, and then you put in your three guiding sutures, and then you seat this valve. So it is just like doing a regular aortic valve replacement with the exception that you use far less sutures and is balloon expanded, which is very different than a TAVR where you're keeping the native valve in place, obviously, because you're not uh, opening the aorta at all. And then it gets ballooned, and then you're essentially you're finished. Uh, so they've looked at time savings, and th there's different things published on this. I think when you look at time savings in the operating room, part of it is surgeon-specific, and some surgeons are a lot faster than others. Part of it is patient-specific. Certain body habituses are much more difficult to work in than others. Size of the aorta, I think, and angles of the aortic valve, especially in minimally invasive cases, play into the time difference. Uh, but there, there's no question that if you control for all those other variables, Putting in three stitches, loading the valve, and seating it and ballooning it in place is a lot faster than putting in 15 pairs of sutures around the annulus. Absolutely no question about that. Um, the longest I've had to wait for the valve to be prepared is about five minutes, and that was on our first couple cases when it, the team was just sort of getting comfortable with loading it. But um, when you look at, you have to be careful when you look at studies, unless it's purely randomized, which is very difficult to do with the amount of variability in, in, that you see in the operating room of patients and surgeons. Um, you know, some of these studies I take with a grain of salt, but even, even here they have shown that the cross-clamp clamp, cross clamp times are better. And I would agree with that. I think that you're going to find that your institution, you might have longer clamp times than other, other published studies, but if, the, if you compare apples to apples, you're going to see shorter cross-clamp times, which then plays into the whole um, the cost of it and, and, and things like that, where the hospital is going to be asking, do, should we be paying extra for this valve? And we'll talk about that in a second. But this is basically the small incision surgery that they're talking about with the three guiding sutures coming down. Uh, and there was, a, there was a trial that showed that uh, there was higher use of small incision approaches. And it makes sense. I would expect that. I think that surgeons are looking for that. They're looking for something that's going to simplify minimally invasive surgery because most of them are not uh, comfortable with, with uh, minimally invasive. And of course, that depends how you define it. In this case, it was upper sternotomy, which we perform. Uh, very little of. Most of our cases are right chest, uh, but that's because we're much more comfortable doing the surgery. So I think uh, whenever you read anything about minimally invasive valve surgery, you have to understand it's coming from an institution that has a certain practice pattern. And, uh, and they'll, they'll adjust their story depending on their experience. It's very hard to translate those practice patterns to other institutions. But at the same hospital, I do believe that a simpler valve to put in is going to improve your ability to do some of these minimally invasive cases. Might not be at the rate that you might see in other places, uh, but it will improve it. Um, and this, these are the time savings um, that we talked about. Uh, and more, more on the cross clamp times and the costs. So when we talk about costs, and some of these things are not mentioned in these papers, but the cost uh, is a factor nowadays more and more. Uh, if you can reduce the time that you're spent on cross clamp time, then there is an operating room cost to that. It's a lower, a shorter time in the operating room. Of course, if you're trying to go too fast and you end up with bleeding afterwards, you're going to be, when you're autonomy, you're going to be in the operating room longer. So you have to be very careful about what the factors are when you're talking about time in the operating room. Uh, but time to implantation should definitely be faster. 
The other big thing, cost, which we took into account when we were looking at these valves, is the cost of the sutures and the delivery systems to put in the standard aortic valves. And now more and more people are using Coronaut, and there's a cost to that device to actually seat sutures. There's a cost to the, all the extra sutures that you're using. And then there's also the deals that are struck with the companies when you, when you negotiate for the price of these valves. So at the end of the day, when we looked at the cost of doing a, a um, sutureless valve versus a sutured valve, actually the cost was not that much. The cost difference was not that much. It was almost a wash, and so the hospital was very happy to get these valves for us if we thought it was going to be, uh, be an improvement on our practice pattern. So um, you'll hear all different things about cost, but you have to really look at the whole picture with cost. And uh, we were fortunate, after digging a little bit, we realized that the, the cost was not as much of a factor. And that's what other people find, although they, don't, they look at ICU days and hospital days, uh, ventilator hours, transfusion rates. Those are numbers that everybody can pull, uh, but those are affected by other things, especially things like uh, ICU days and hospital ward days, because there's different practice patterns. Some places have uh, very good ICUs and, and wards where they have a lot of help of people to take care of the patients, and patients can move through in a, in a, a more streamlined fashion. Whether if you have that or don't have that, that can impact how fast you can move a patient out of the hospital a lot more than just what kind of valve you put in. So there's a lot of confounding variables here. Uh, but in general, uh, you should have a shorter cross clamp time, and if you can do everything else the same, you'll have a shorter time in the operating room. And that's been what we have found with you know, less than 100 cases already. Uh, the hemodynamics are not going to be an issue with this valve. In fact, I think that the hemodynamics are probably better. Uh, you don't have a big cuff of pledged sutures in the, in the LV outflow tract just underneath the valve, uh, and especially on the smaller valves. And they found very low uh, transvalvular gradients. We've seen the exact same thing, and I think that this valve is not going to have that, that problem. Um, and they've looked at the gradients out uh, for a few years, which I would expect are going to be very good. So we get into the preparation for the case. Uh, I don't think from a perfusion standpoint it has really been any different. I think, you know, we're cannulating the same, we're doing the case the same, we're giving the same cardioplegia, at least now. Um, but uh, there is some time for the, the circulators and the scrub nurses to uh, put everything together. Uh, they have a training pathway for you. Um, comes in a nice box, and uh, you have the valve, and you have this balloon delivery system with the inflation device. One nice thing is that it uses the same sizers as the Magna valve, so uh, when we're sizing the valve, um, if we choose to use a Magna valve, uh, it's the exact same size around to get our exercises, and that has actually helped in making the case go along a lot, a lot faster. Uh, one thing I would say about sizing this valve uh, is that you have to be very careful how you size this valve. There, you don't have the leeway like you do on a sutured valve. If it's a little loose or a little, t or, well, a little tight is one thing, but if it's a little loose, I think you have, you're going to be more concerned about a possible power valve or leak with this valve. This valve, what we have found is that it has to be right on, and I wish that they made them every millimeter, not every two millimeters, because it really has to be an exact fit. Um, whereas with a suture valve, does not need to be. And we, they don't make it, uh, once you get to 27, that's it. And if we put in some 29 valves, you couldn't use it. Um, it. Really, I think there's some nuances that we're learning. The, the more important aspects of this valve are the nuances that, that we are coming to terms with. It is not a typical sutured valve. And the sizing um, is probably the most important part of it, actually. Everyone can deliver this valve. You can balloon it. You know, it's, it's not idiot proof, but it's pretty good. It's pretty good, especially for surgeons who aren't used to doing balloon stuff. Um, it's worked out pretty well. <clears throat> um, we do three non pledgeted sutures or four. It gets washed for a couple minutes. They, they recommend using um, snares or tourniquets to seat the valve down to make sure it's seated. Um, you know, the aortic root varies in configuration among patients, and if you have a larger root, with large sinuses, it's pretty easy to see around the valve. You get into some of these small roots with uh, small sinuses, a lot of calcium around sinotubular junction, it can definitely be challenging. And that's where we like to use the valve the most because these are going to be the harder cases to do. Uh, and, and that's where you're going to get the advantage of the time savings and you're going to get the advantage of the low, low uh, transvalvular gradients. Um, but seating the valve once it's down to make sure it's down is, is very important. And part of that, what I've found, is you get a feel for it. You try to see it. 
Um, you should be able to see it every time, but a lot of this is going to be the surgeons kind of getting used to how this valve goes in. It is definitely a new paradigm in valves. There's no question about it, even though it's done with the same techniques of opening, you know, cross clamping, opening the aortic, debriding the aortic valve. Uh, the nuances of sizing it and seating it down are different, and that's going to take time for people to get comfortable with. So we have a video, I think. Do we have a video? So this is the animated video of how it goes in. This will sh show it a lot better than I explained it. Um, <laughs> so we, cr we go on pump, we cross clamp, we rest the heart, uh, we debride the valve, we put in three guiding sutures, sometimes four, uh, and then it sits right at the annulus and the uh, cuff is beneath it down here. Um, so it sits, the upper part of the valve is where the valve, the magnet valve would always sit. Then you blow the balloon up and the balloon seats this skirt underneath here and that's where you get the seating. We have found that it has not had any impact on the mitral valve. And then <clears throat> you cut the sutures, take the valve out, and then th those are the holding sutures. And then you would tie down or core knot, however you want to do the, uh, the guiding sutures that are there. And uh, we have found that um, it seats pretty easily. The balloon is very easy to do. Uh, you know, there's no crimping involved with this. It is a simplified version uh, than um, the Percival valve, which we have used. Uh, so we've moved more towards the Intuity valve at this point. So uh, we've been happy with it. I think these valves are going to be here to stay, but there are nuances. It's not a panacea, and there's going to be some learning curve to get comfortable with this. There's going to be different kinds of complications you can have with this that you don't have with sutured valves. So I think it's going to just take time for surgeons to, uh, to be comfortable doing it. It's not going to replace every magna or epic valve out there, but it's going to help. And especially we find um, it would help with more complicated operations where you're doing double or triple valves, things like that, where you're really looking to cut off an extra 10 or 15 minutes here or there off the clamp time. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for uh, listening. Uh, if you have any specific questions around perfusion, I'd be interested in hearing them. Thanks.